morning, everyone. Welcome this morning to Easter Sunday at New Life Community Church. I'm Pastor Mike Nadelko. Glad you've joined us. Christ is risen. risen indeed. And you're supposed to say he is risen indeed. So when I say that, turn around to the people in the room, say he's risen indeed, give a knuckle bounce, an elbow bounce, a high five, whatever, okay? But just be listening. Christ is risen. There you go. And the girls are doing it here. So there we go. And you're doing it in your room. This is a, 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 an important Sunday, a day when we all celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ across the world. Churches are celebrating this and we're celebrating this. We've got the flowers on the cross. We're wearing our bright clothes. We are celebrating Easter. We sure wish you were here. Our original plan was we would have a nice little kind of brunch down at the picnic shelter. The kids would be looking for chocolate. But alas, we are redoing Easter in a different way today, but I'm glad you joined us because today is an important day. As we look at the account that John gives us in John 20 of the resurrection. But understand this. If you watch the Good Friday service, you'll, you'll know. A Friday was a dark day. It was a gloomy day. It was a sad day. And Sunday starts that way. Sunday starts with darkness and grief. It starts with the disciples and those that follow Jesus waking up and not sure what their lives are supposed to mean on that day. Darkness and grief. It tells us in John chapter 20, verse 1, that now very early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been moved away from the entrance. Verse 2, it says, she, So she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told him, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Darkness and grief. Saturday was probably one of the longest days of their life. Unsure as to what the next step would be. Not sure what life would mean from this point forward. And Sunday comes, Mary Magdalene gets up, she's going to go to the tomb, she's going to anoint the body or something, leave some flowers there, who knows. But here she comes and finds that the stone has been rolled away. She's confused. She's concerned. Obviously, in that day and age, it wasn't uncommon for people to come and to rob graves. Maybe sometimes people were buried with their jewelry or with coins or with other expensive artifacts. And so people would often open up tombs and steal things off the bodies. It's gruesome, I know, and it's gross, but that was the reality. So this is what she assumes has happened. Someone has taken the body of Jesus away. Darkness and grief. That's how Sunday starts. Darkness and grief. It tells us in verse 3 that Peter and the other disciple set out to go to the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and reached the tomb first. The other disciple, of course, being John himself. He's talking in the third person about himself. He bent down and saw the strips of linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who had been following him, arrived and went right into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen cloth lying there. And the face cloth, which had been around Jesus' head, not lying with the strips of linen cloth, but rolled up in a place by itself. Darkness and grief. And so they go to the tomb. And darkness and grief turns into discovery and ultimately to belief as they examine the data and the information that's in front of them. Yes, the stone is rolled away. The stone was a huge large stone, which normally would require four to, to five men to, to roll out of the way. It's, it's rolled out of the way. And inside the tomb, as they discover, they see that there the linen strips are there. And, and there is the head cloth, and it's been rolled up and, and placed down on, on top of, of the place where they had laid his body. And, and so they're confused. Darkness and grief. Now they're at the point of, of discovery. What is going on in the tomb? Now, there was a rumor that someone had stolen Jesus' body. But let's just think about this practically. If you were to steal the body of Jesus, would you unwrap it? It's in the point of decay. It's been there three days. Would you go through the process of unwrapping that body, taking out the naked body, and leaving the cloth behind? Probably not. The, the cloth is there and laid in such a way that they assume that the, the, the body almost just kind of ris, rose right out of it. It's like Jesus sat up and took off the head covering and just laid it, rolled it up and laid it down and, and walked out of the tomb. 
darkness and grief turns to discovery and belief. You see that in verse 8? Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, came in, and he saw and believed. Verse 9, for they did not yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. So I mean, John comes in, and, and he sees this, and he observes this, he discovers this, and he, and he believes that, that Jesus is no longer there. He's risen. Christ is risen. Darkness and grief leads to discovery and belief. It says the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary still is stuck in the darkness and the grief. She hasn't yet moved to the point of discovery or to belief. It says in verse 11 that Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she bent down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And Mary replied, They have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've put him. And when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Just to pause for a moment. Could it be that you could discover Jesus in your darkness and grief? Could it be that the journey that you're on, maybe you're watching today for the first time, you, you're new to church, you're just like, it's Easter Sunday, maybe I should watch a service. Could it be that in your uncertainty, in your paranoia, in your fear, in your loneliness, in the grief that you're walking through, that you could discover Jesus in this moment? It works for Mary. She doesn't think that Jesus is there, but he's right there in the middle of the grief with her. Her dark mourning is going to turn to light in just a minute as she realizes who is standing in front of her. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? <laughs> because she thought he was the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you have put him and I will take him. I mean, she doesn't get it. She's stuck in the darkness and the grief. She's just stuck in a rut. She can't get out of it. All she can think about is, I need to see that body. 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 She's not realizing who's standing in front of her. And maybe that's your reality today. You're so caught up in the circumstances of your life. You don't realize that Jesus is standing in front of you as the risen Lord inviting you into relationship and into, into experience life with him. That he's, he's, he's calling you out from that darkness and grief to discovery and belief today. Just like he is here with Mary. She's looking for Jesus, but she's looking in all the wrong places. John has been, throughout his gospel, trying to show us who Jesus is. And, and, and he's a first century eyewitness and close companion of Jesus. I think he's reliable testimony on our behalf of who Jesus is. You're not going to find Jesus on A&E, in Time Magazine, on Biography, in some other, you know, internet site that, that has different, you know, supposed, you know, ideas about Jesus. Let's go to the, to the source witness here. John says, this is who Jesus is. He's the bread of life. He's the light of the world. He's the good shepherd. He's the door. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the resurrection and the life. And here he stands before Mary. And he says to her, in verse 16, <laughs> Jesus said to her, Mary. Now obviously, she doesn't know who this guy is. She thinks he's the gardener. And suddenly he says her name. And then she realizes that, like, all oh, the lights go on. Boom, this is who it is. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which was a a term of endearment and deep respect, which means teacher. Jesus replied, Do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Go to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, obviously, it's not like Jesus is like, no, don't touch me. I mean, probably Mary has now grabbed his feet and is squeezing and holding on to him because throughout the Gospel of John, that's where we find Mary, at Jesus' feet. She's just, she loves Jesus. She's holding on to Jesus. And then she grabs him again. He's like, look, look, Mary, you, you got to let me go because this isn't over. There's more to come. The best, in fact, is yet to come, Mary. So look, I got things to do, Mary, but it's me and I'm here. You can trust me now. Darkness and grief turn to discovery and 
belief. And Jesus says there in verse 17, go to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. You see, what he does for Mary here is he says, guess what? We're now a family. Because I died and rose again, now everyone who is in who believes in me, joins the family. My father is now your father. My God is your God. We are together in this, in God's forever family. You now have experienced and can experience life forever with me because I've accomplished salvation now for for everyone because I died and I rose again. Here I am. What's really interesting too about this this whole story is is first and foremost, the two men show up, which in in Jewish court of law, you require two male witnesses to verify something. But the very first person, according to John, that Jesus appears to is a woman. Jesus is elevating the status of women in the first century. He is saying, yeah, and and he's, he's allowing Mary the unique privilege of seeing him first. And it says in verse 18 that Mary Magdalene came and informed the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what Jesus had said to her. I've seen the Lord. And as the rest of the Gospel of John, the end of chapter 20 and chapter 21 will show you, you should read it on your own. Jesus appears to multiple people in multiple places. And he shows them that, yes, he is alive. He cooks for them. He eats with them. He tells Thomas, touch me, Thomas. Look, here I am. He has this unique resurrection body, which is able to pass through walls and come and go. It's, It's totally cool, and it's real. And that's the body that we look forward to receiving when we, too, leave this world and go to be with Jesus. Because of of what Jesus has done, we can have hope and life. Darkness and grief turns to discovery and belief because Jesus Christ is the risen Lord. And John wants you and I to come to this point of belief. So, so as, as I think about this passage, I mean, you are on this journey somewhere. And maybe today you, you started today in a dark place. The shadows of your circumstances are very heavy on your soul today. And this text in John chapter 20, which reveals and shows us Jesus Christ, is intended to bring you out of that gloom and into the light, which is Jesus Christ himself. Maybe you're in a place of grief. You're grieving the, the, your job. You're grieving the fact that you can't go to school. You're grieving the fact that your sports are canceled. You're, you're grieving the fact that you can't get together with extended family today uh, across the, the, the provinces or, or the countries because of the restrictions. I mean, you, you're in a point of grief. Maybe you've actually lost someone and you feel the grief of this moment today. And, and Jesus is, is there to meet you in that point of your need, of your grief. Maybe you're at a point of discovery and that's why you tuned in today. You're like, I, I have no idea what I should do with my life. Maybe, this, maybe if I go into church, on this church service, I, I can learn something. Well, you're the right place because as Peter and John and Mary would discover, so you can discover that Jesus Christ is truly alive. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Yes. Maybe that's your point. You're, you're at a point of discovery. You're, you're seeking and you're learning. And John would say, let me show you who Jesus is. And let me show you what you can do with that truth. You can believe in him and have life that exists and lasts forever. And maybe you're at a point of belief where you need to cross the line. You need to move from, from the darkness and the grief and the discovery into a, a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And you can do that today. You can believe in Jesus Christ. You can put your faith in him. And you can enter into this family. You can become part of what Jesus refers to as my father and your father, my God and your God. Yeah, you join his forever family. The resurrection and the truth of Jesus' resurrection changes us. It transforms us. And it changes our perspective on life. I have a story that I'd like to share about that. And you know I love a good story. If you have heard me before in other places, I've probably shared this story, so I apologize if you're watching from other locations and you may have heard this one before. But every good story deserves to be retold. 
This is a story from the tale of the tardy, 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 tardy ox cart from Chuck Swindoll. Uh, it's actually from 1985, a guy named Harry Pritchard Jr. Once upon a time, I had a young friend named Philip. Philip was born with Down syndrome. He was a pleasant child, happy it seemed, but increasingly aware of the difference between himself and other children. Philip went to Sunday school at the Methodist Church. His teacher, also a friend of mine, taught the third grade class with Philip and nine other eight-year-old boys and girls. You know eight-year-olds. And Philip, because of the differences, was not readily accepted. But my teacher friend was creative, and he helped the group of eight-year-olds. They learned, they laughed, they played together, and they really cared about one another. Even though eight-year-olds don't say they care about each other out loud, <laughs> my friend could see it. He knew it. He also knew that Philip was not really part of that group. Philip did not choose, nor did he want to be different. He just was. And that was the way things were. My friend had a marvelous idea for his class the Sunday after Easter last year. You know those things that patios come in, the containers that look like great big eggs? This is from the 80s. I apologize. Just a parenthetical note there. <laughs> they used to come in big plastic eggs. My friend had collected 10 of them. The children loved it, and when he brought them into the room, each child was to get one. It was a beautiful spring day, and the assignment was for each child to go outside, find a symbol for a new life, put it into the egg, and bring it back to the classroom. They would then open and share their new life symbols and surprises one by one. It was glorious. It was confusing. It was wild. They all ran around the church grounds gathering their symbols and returned to the classroom. They put all the eggs on a table, and then the teacher began to open them. All the children stood around the table. He opened one, and there was a flower. And they oohed and awed. He opened another, and there was a little butterfly. Beautiful, the girls all said, since it's hard for eight-year-old boys to say beautiful. <laughs> he opened another, and there was a rock. And as third graders will, some laughed, some said, that's crazy. How's a rock supposed to be like new life? But the smart little fellow who, spoke, who found it spoke up, that's mine. And I knew all of you would get flowers and buds and leaves and butterflies and stuff like that. So I got a rock because I wanted to be different. And for me, that's new life. <laughs> they all laughed. My teacher friend said something to himself about the profundity of eight-year-olds and opened the next one. There was nothing there. The other children, as eight-year-olds will, said, that's not fair. That's stupid. Somebody didn't do it right. Then my teacher friend felt a tug on his shirt and he looked down. Philip was standing beside him. It's mine, Philip said. It's mine. And the children said, you don't ever do things right, Philip. There's nothing there. I did so do it, Philip said. I did do it. It's empty. The tomb is empty. There was silence. A very full silence. And for you people who don't believe in miracles, I want to tell you that one happened that day last spring. From that time on, it was different. Philip suddenly became part of that group of eight-year-old children. They took him in. He was set free from the tomb of his differences. Philip died last summer. His family had known since the time he was born that he wouldn't live out a full lifespan. Many other things had been wrong with his tiny body, and so late last July, with an infection that most normal children could have quickly shrugged off, Philip died. The mystery simply enveloped him. At the funeral, nine eight-year-old children marched up to the altar, not with flowers to cover the stark reality of death, Nine eight-year-olds with their Sunday school teacher marched up to that altar and laid on it an empty egg. An empty, old, discarded pantyhose egg. <laughs> New life in Jesus Christ. That's what the resurrection possibility is for you and me today. And could it be that Jesus, that this time of difficulty and this season that we're living in could be a time of discovery for you, where you could discover more of what it means to walk and to live with Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm speaking to you that, that come to New Life and those of you that, that call churches home, that know Jesus is your Savior. Could it be that this season that we're in, as, as strange and odd as it is, could be an opportunity for you and for me to discover a new level of relationship with Jesus. Darkness and grief turn to discovery and belief. 
So we could open up an egg and it's, it's empty, but that tells us more than if we put something in there. That this empty tomb points to a, a living reality and possibility for you and me with Jesus Christ. Now understand, Jesus doesn't stay with the disciples. He shows up, he disappears. He shows up, he disappears. I mean, he, he shows up to small groups. He, he walks with two guys down the road for a long time. He shows up at one point in Corinthians, it says, to 500 people. And then he shows up at his ascension and, and there he is and he gives them a final commission and then he disappears into heaven. Why does Jesus not just walk with them and sleep with them? Because he's trying to get them ready for the new reality. Jesus wants to be with them forever and ever. And the only way he can do that is if he's with them spiritually. He's going to give them his Holy Spirit so that they can have his presence with them all the time. And the truth is, when you and when I believe in Jesus Christ, I receive the Holy Spirit. And I have the presence of Jesus with me. And I have the capacity to grow in that knowledge and that relationship with Jesus every day. This is the truth of Easter. Jesus is preparing his disciples. And he's, as he leaves, I mean, he, he says on the mountaintop, you know, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. But he's not with them. He's, and then he ascends into heaven. Well, how is he with them? Because he gives them his Holy Spirit. And he gives me his Holy Spirit. And he gives you his Holy Spirit. And this season, even of separation, you're watching this, not in the church building, not celebrating with church friends and, and not being able to, to enjoy the fellowship. But remember, we, we're still together because spiritually we are connected with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And he wants to teach you and me even in this season that we're living in. I grew up going to church and we sang hymns and one of the hymns that I, I can remember singing on Easter was this one. It's got some great words to it. Listen. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives he lives salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks to me a long life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ, the King. The hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. Now another is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me. A long life's narrow way, he lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. And today, this is a living truth. If you watch the announcements, you'll see Katie talked, to, read 1 Peter 3. We've been saved into a living hope. You know, it, it's not like buying a lottery ticket and, and, and hoping you'll, you'll get a big payout. It's not like opening up a car magazine and, and, and you know, mouth-watering over a Lamborghini or Ferrari you know you're never going to own. It's not like watching the lifestyles of the rich and famous and, and envisioning yourself, you know, owning your own island or some castle in, the, you know, in, in England. I mean, it, this is a living hope for everyone. Young and old, rich and poor, educated, uneducated, blue-collar, white-collar, doesn't matter what your skin color is what your gender is. It doesn't matter, male, female. I mean, we all can embrace and experience the living hope of Jesus Christ. And I hope that you do today. If you don't know Jesus Christ, today is the day for you to believe in Jesus Christ and to experience salvation full and free. And for us that know Jesus, today is the day to say, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to move up and out in the new life that Jesus Christ brings to me. I want to grow. He lives. He walks with me, talks with me all along life's narrow way. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. May that living hope encourage you today 
as you celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is risen. He is risen indeed. God bless you. May the truth of the risen Lord bring you great joy and encouragement today as you celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you.